you. Thanks. Um, I wish I'd brought the cauliflowers lecture along, Alan. So this is a completely different lecture. Well, thank you for that. I'm, I'm really moving words, whoever wrote that. Um, and thanks to the organisers of the Bristol, the best of Bristol. Um, I can't remember when I was last so pleased with the outcome of a democratic process. I mean, it just seemed to me to be, usually it doesn't really yield a, a good result, but this one was, but thank you. So my, my subject this evening is the great Irish poet W.B. Yeats. There he is with his, his glittering eyes. Everyone commented on his glittering eyes. He seemed to be seeing visions in the mid-distance. Um, in fact, he was very, very short-sighted. But when he died in 1939, on the eve of the Second World War, um, another great poet, but this time an English poet, W.H. Auden, wrote an elegy for him in memory of W.B. Yeats. And the first line of the second stanza would become famous and often quoted. You were silly like us. Your gift survived it all. I wonder what Auden meant exactly by you were silly, calling Yeats silly, silly like us. Did he simply mean that Yeats was human and therefore... He was a bit daft, as everyone is occasionally. Yes, up to a point. But I think saying that formally, as it were, in an elegy, you were silly. It's as if someone were to get up to deliver a funeral oration and begin by saying, everybody knows the deceased was bonkers. It's that kind of personal um, insinuation which I think is actually going on here. So Auden, I think, is actually saying, not that Yeats was fallible like everyone, but he was, he was suggesting very subtly that there was something about Yeats and his poetry that many people would think of as particularly silly. More silly than the rest of us, in fact. Really silly. Bonkers, indeed. Luckily, he says, Yeats' gift for poetry survived all the silliness of his life. And Auden, I think, is, um, by saying the poetry was a gift, your gift, you survived it all, is also subtly taking something away from Yeats in the act of giving. But so, this evening, what I want to think about is what may have been silly about uh, WB Yeats, what we believe to be silly, and perhaps even to ask ourselves about what we are prepared to believe in or not. So from a very early age and throughout his life, WB Yeats was interested in all forms of the occult. And when he was a young man in the 1880s and the 1890s, he helped his great friend and collaborator, Lady Gregory, an aristocrat, collect uh, folklore stories from Irish peasants. They went around the cottages in rural Ireland, hearing stories about fairies and other supernatural phenomena, and writing them down. He saw this as part of a larger Irish uh, national revival rooted in Irish folk culture and its belief. And as a result, he published in um, 1893 a book called The Celtic Twilight, which is a book of folklore, supernatural stories, visions and anecdotes gathered from the peasantry. Twilight for Yeats, remember, was the hour just before dawn. Twilight, what Sarah Kane would later call the 448 psychosis hour, when your brain is most deranged. Set your alarms for 448, you wake up bonkers. So Twilight, the Celtic Twilight for Yeats was was a, a, a kind of compendium of stories gathered from the Irish peasantry. This is a famous cartoon by Max Beerbohm, uh, Mr. W.B. Yeats presenting Mr. George Moore to the Queen of the Fairies. And George Moore was an, an Irish novelist. So he, he was famous for this uh, attachment to fairies. We can say then, in that some sense, Yeats believed in fairies. Is this silly? Yes, it certainly was, concluded W.H. Auden, and in 1930, Auden published an essay uh, in the form of a courtroom drama, The Public versus the Late, though he wasn't yet dead, uh, Mr. William Butler Yeats. And it said, What are we to say of a man whose earliest writings attempted to revive a belief in fairies and whose favourite themes were legends of barbaric heroes with unpronounceable names, work which has ap been aptly and wittily described as chaff about Bran? Bran was a hero from Irish mythology, so that's a joke. In 1900, he believed in fairies, that was bad enough. But in 1930, we're confronted with a pitiful, a deplorable spectacle of a grown man occupied with the mumbo jumbo of magic and the nonsense of India. Um, I'll come to what he believed later in his life, later, but let's just stay a little longer for a moment with the 1890s and 1880s. This was the period known as the fin de siècle, and it was one during which there was a general 
uh, growth of interest in things occult, particularly in London and in Dublin. It was the century's end, and at such times, there are often signs of what we might call decadence, wild theories and ap apocalyptic prophecies, people searching for new age answers, what Auden would call silliness. In 1890, Yeats had been initiated into a secret society um, in Dublin. The, it was called the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. It was a society for the study and practice of magic, of esoteric knowledge, with its own secret rituals and ceremonies and elaborate symbolism. It was Hogwarts for adults. Uh, Yeats was initiated into the temple of Isis Urania, and his motto was demon est deus inversus. The demon is the other side of God. What this means is that what seem to be contraries or opposites are in fact fused together in some way. They're interdependent. These are familiar ideas from William Blake, The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, but, and Yeats was very influenced by William Blake. The demon is only the reverse side of the god. So the occult, tarot cards, numerology or magic numbers. Members of the uh, Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, that's the only photograph I could find of an actual member, wore robes and headgear with mystical symbols on it. They actually had wands. They had wands. At the head of the order was a strange, uh, mysterious figure called Madame Blavatsky. She was a famous Russian medium. She was charismatic. She was inscrutable. She had glittering eyes. Look at her glittering eyes. I think this must have helped her a lot, her, her glittering eyes. She was the author of books with titles like uh, The Secret Doctrine, The Voice of the Silence, and Yeats attended seances with her um, at one of which he recorded being violently thrown against a wall. He wrote, was it a part of myself? Something always to be danger, perhaps? Or had it come from without, as it seemed? Was it a part of myself, or had it come from without? And that is the question. Another, someone claimed to have taken a spirit photograph of Yeats. Uh, clearly showing, as you can see, incontrovertibly demonstrating the materialisation of spirit ectoplasm just above his head. What this definitely was not was a simple collage produced from uh, newspaper cutouts. Is this silly? Gullibility, uh, the over-willingness to believe, is only the reverse side of scepticism and unbelief. They are conjoined twins. What Auden dismissed as the mumbo-jumbo of magic and the nonsense of India are in fact great traditions of, of, of knowledge, of secret truths and mysteries. And, and Yeats was fascinated by theosophical speculation, the theosophy, literally God's wisdom. He was interested in all aspects of this. He was interested in esoteric Buddhism, esoteric Hinduism. He studied the Vedas and the Upanishads, the Tibetan masters, uh, occult philosophy, the history of alchemy and magic the Neoplatonists of the 5th century, the Kabbalah, that system of uh, Jewish mysticism, colour symbolism, the hidden substance of God lay, he believed, in colour and in music. Is that silly? All of this Yeats absorbed and studied. Throughout his life he was uh, as you'd guess, intensely interested in all aspects of uh, the paranormal and in 1914 he travelled to France with a companion from the Society for Psychical Research to investigate a supposed miracle in the Church of Mirabeau where uh, religious pictures had been bleeding and the roof of the church had dripped with blood at the elevation of the host. He took this very seriously, indeed. And there's this interesting thing. Remember, the journal of the Society for Psychical Research at this time published reports not only of occult events but early psychoanalytical essays and papers. So there was this strange, interesting convergence of the supernatural and the new science, if that's what it was, the new science of psychoanalysis. There are two sides conjoined. Yeats experimented with hallucinogenic substances, such as mescal and hashish. On another occasion, uh, for, the same, for the same society, he researched, he investigated a certain David Wilson, who was a solicitor and chemist, 
uh, living in Hastings in East Sussex. And Wilson claimed to have designed a machine that could receive and amplify voices from the spirit world, a kind of ear hole into the unknown region, as he put it. He called his invention the little metal humanoid. Yeats wrote to him to say that you may have made the greatest discovery of the modern world. Unfortunately, as the First World War was in full swing and, and some of the voices received by uh, the little metal humanoid happened to be in German, uh, the police seized the greatest discovery of the modern world as an illegal radio. But Yeats believed that the spiritual world penetrates, um, is close to, overlaps with the real world. Rationalism, he said, is the great sin against art. Rationalism. Over-believing in the capacity of your own reason, your common sense, refusing uh, the validity of mystery. This is the enemy of art, he believed. For most of his life, again, you won't be surprised to hear, he took um, astrological readings, horoscopes, in order to try to make sense of his life. He was guided by them. He even went over traumas in his past by relating them to astrological movements, um, a process he called, which was called rectification. So you go back over your life and you look at um, uh, horoscopes for the past. He believed in life after death, in the multiple lives of the soul, in reincarnation. He believed in what he called dreaming back, that after death we live our lives back in reverse, gradually returning to a state of innocence, prenatal innocence. He believed in what he called the anima mundi, or the spiritus mundi, sometimes he called it, the world soul. Uh, there's an early modern picture of it, the world soul. In fact, what this was was a common bank of memory, of spirit, shared by everyone across generations. If you think about later in the 20th century, the philosopher and psychoanalyst Carl Jung would describe something very similar in um, his notion of the collective unconscious. There are certain images that everyone has in their unconscious. Yeats believed that we were surrounded by disembodied spirits who could move in and out of different time moments and sometimes occupy our own bodies, so you could be possessed by them. All passionate moments, he said, recur again and again, for passion desires its own recurrence more than any event. If Homer were abolished in every library and in every living mind, the tale of Troy might still emerge as a vision. He believed in occult foreknowledge, that through clairvoyance we could glimpse the future and therefore we kind of participated in bringing it into existence. We sort of willed events, future events, to happen. So here's a poem. Um, it's from 1914 and it draws upon some of these ideas, particularly the, um, the idea of the soul's life after death. It's quite a difficult poem. It's, it, it's called The Cold Heaven. Suddenly I saw the cold and rook delighting heaven that seemed as though ice burned and was but the more ice. And thereupon imagination and heart were driven so wild that every casual thought of that and this vanished and left but memories that should be out of season with the hot blood of youth, of love crossed long ago. And I took all the blame out of all sense and reason until I cried and trembled and rocked to and fro, riddled with light. Ah, when the ghost begins to quicken, confusion of the deathbed over, is it sent out naked on the roads, as the books say, and stricken by the injustice of the skies for punishment? Um, the rook delighting heaven. Yeats is great on these hyphenated adjectives, nouns yoked to verbs like this. In other poems, famous poems, we have the mackerel crowded seas, that dolphin torn, that gong tormented sea. James Joyce in Ulysses, um, possibly parodying Yeats, has the scrotum tightening sea, the snot green sea, kind of bringing it down slightly. In other poems by Yeats, we have the bee loud glade, the dew cumbered skies, the dew cumbered skies. Here it's the rook delighting heaven. Are the rooks delighting in heaven or is heaven delighting in the rooks? Well, both at once in a fusion of reverse sides. And then there is the vision of opposites, of fire and ice, in the ice burning, which was but the more ice. 
Yeats, what Yeats is describing, he seems to be describing, is a sudden onset of emotion that seems to drive out any casual thought of this and that and leave him with memories only of an unhappy early love, love crossed long ago. But the feeling seems also to come with the removal of all blame or bitterness. It's an ecstatic feeling this time, this memory, like being riddled with light. And it prompts a very strange speculation, a vision then of the cold skies as a, pun a kind of punishment for the soul after death. So that when the ghost after death comes alive again or quickens, is it, he asks, is it then sent out naked on the road and stricken by the injustice of the skies for punishment? It's a strange, it's a haunting poem. Um, it, you can't really summarise it, but this is, I'll, I'll try. The poet looks at the cold sky, he remembers an early unhappy love, he feels ecstatic, as if all the pain had gone from that love, and he wonders whether this sky-triggered ecstasy may be reversed after death. In other words, the ways in which, I think, uh, the ways in which memory tends to transform painful experience in life into something more subtle over time, he fears may be reversed after death. And notice it's the injustice rather than the justice of the skies. Punishment is the meeting out of justice. Here Yeats turns the thought around and has the injustice of the skies, the hard, cold indifference of winter sky as a kind of um, purgatorial punishment. It's a fusion of, of reverses, of reverse sides. Try and hold that thought in your mind. <laughs> Many people ask Yeats, yes, 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 but do you really believe all this stuff about reincarnation and magic, all this weird shit? In a letter of 1901, he would answer, whatever we build in the imagination will accomplish itself in the circumstances of our lives. Does this mean that if I think really hard and really often about winning the lottery, that it will accomplish itself in my life? Isn't that the attitude of uh, people who go on deal or no deal? Isn't that how they decide which of those boxes, which of those bloody boxes they need to open? <laughs> I've got this feeling about Brian's box. <laughs> I've built it in my imagination. Does this mean if I imagine something over and over again, I have a thick head of lustrous dark hair like Elvis, that somehow it will come to be? No, it doesn't mean that. It means that um, the vision of life to which you attach yourself in your imagination the way you shape the world in your own mind will determine the world that you discover and the things that happen to you. And that you can change the shapes and visions of your imagination. And therefore you can change the nature of your life. You can build and it will be accomplished. But not necessarily. <laughs> One thing Yeats built in his imagination over many years but which did not accomplish itself ever in his life really, was his union with his great love. Maud gone, there she is. Maud gone. Terrifying looking, actually, isn't she? Um, she was a political revolutionary. She was an extreme Irish nationalist. She was anglophobic, really, English hating. She was extraordinarily beautiful or striking. She was Catholic. She was an actress who had acted in some of Yeats's early plays. Their relationship was this long, painful drama on his part, hopeless infatuation. Though they shared, they did share this deep, intimate friendship. They also shared uh, spiritual visions. They were convinced that they had met and been married in a previous life. Sometimes they said they'd been brother and sister in a previous life. Both of them believed in the possibility of thought transference or telepathy, reading each other's minds. They also believed in astral travel, the meeting and conversing with spirits in dreams. They regularly met up and hung out together on the astral plane when dreaming. You should try this yourselves. Uh, get together in dreams on the astral plane. I'll see you there. Where shall we go? Where shall we meet? 4.48. <laughs> um, nevertheless, on the plane of being wide awake, Yeats's marriage proposals were turned down over and over again, su or subtly deflected. Then he came the painful discovery that uh, she was married already, um, soon she separated from her husband. Her husband had been one of the leaders, actually, of the 1916 Easter Rising in Dublin. Yeats raised his hopes once again. There was a brief consummation of their relationship in Paris, in a hotel, and then there were long years of further unrequited love. Eventually, Yeats decided to propose to her daughter, Isiolt. Why not? 
he was, he was, he was 52, she was 22. Uh, again, he was turned down. Yeats thought that Mordgon's politics bordered on fanaticism, and they quarrelled, especially over Irish nationalism. She was much more revolutionary than him, she, violently so. Uh, she was imprisoned by the British a couple of times, thought to be a security risk. She hated the British, or rather the English. But he made of that quarrel, he made of that quarrel of his great passion for her, many poems. Here's one. This is a poem about Maud Gon. it's called No Second Troy. It's from 1910. Why should I blame her that she filled my days with misery? Or that she would of late have taught to ignorant men most violent ways? Or hurled the little streets upon the great had they but courage equal to desire? What could, have made, what could have made her peaceful with a mind that nobleness made simple as a fire, with beauty like a tightened bow, a kind that is not natural in, age, in an age like this, being high and solitary and most stern? Why, what could she have done, being what she is? Was there another Troy for her to burn? Yeats turned everything and everyone in his life into a kind of personal mythology. He had elaborate associations, mythological associations with people, and she was associated with Helen of Troy. So was there another Troy for her to burn? And here, in, in some sense, he's forgiving Maud Gon. He's forgiving Maud Gon for making his life misery, uh, for her fanaticism, because she has a kind of beauty that is not easily found in this age, he says, that is high and solitary and most stern. Well, at the age of 52, in fact, later the same year, after he'd proposed to Maud Gon's daughter, he actually married the 24-year-old Georgie Hyde Lees. <coughs> there she is. Um, Yeats was still, I think, in love with Isult, and probably still in love with her mother Maud, and may appeared, have appeared cold, perhaps even impotent, on the honeymoon. Then a miracle occurred. Georgie began channeling spirits, spirit voices from beyond the grave. She began what is known as automatic writing, writing down messages from so-called con controls or instructors. Yeats asked her questions. The spirits replied. Now, I think you can see, even from this photograph, that Georgie was a very clever person. And if we were to be ungenerous, we might say that she gave Yeats the kind of replies that he was looking for, or even sometimes the kind of replies that suited her. The spirit guides told him, for example, to get over Maud Gong. <laughs> um, occasionally they would tell Yeats to stop asking so many questions about um, the occult and have more sex with your wife. <laughs> this was some kind of breakthrough. When she became pregnant, the spirit voices predicted a son, uh, whom they said would be the reincarnation of the child of a dead female relative who visited them during seances. They also suggested that this son might be an avatar or a kind of prophet figure who would be an important person in the coming apocalyptic times. So they were very, very excited. The son turned out to be a daughter. But when Anne was born, Yeats wondered whether she was the reincarnation he wondered whether his daughter was the reincarnation of the female relative who visited them in seances, and that he himself might, might be the reincarnation of this dead relative's husband, and also her son. <laughs> this would mean that his daughter was both an ex-lover and his own ex-mother. There was never a dull moment in the, <laughs> in the, eight, in the, eight, in the eights household. Um, well, what they did together, what, they, what, what Yeats and George produced, what he, he called his wife George, uh, what they worked out from these automatic writing sessions was a vast system, which they published in 1925 under the title uh, A Vision. And it, came, it contained diagrams um, such as this, explaining its theories. No one really understood the theories of a vision. I don't really think Yeats understood it. There's this very interesting contradiction. You know, he, he says rationalism is the enemy of art, is the great sin against art, rationalism. And then he produces this book of extraordinarily complex patterns and systems, which, which are a kind of parody of rationalism, really. Um, 
This is the Gaia, one of his famous kind of ideas, which was two intersecting cones reversed, which showed the way history worked in these cycles um, across millennia. Basically, one age would begin in the ending of another age, and they would be kind of bound up together, the ending and the beginning. Yeats believed very very strongly that the era dominated by Christian civilization was coming to an end in the 1920s and another era, a terrifying era, would soon replace it. And of course the most famous poem he wrote about these historical cycles was called The Second Coming, which was published in 1920. So I'm going to read The Second Coming, say a few things about it. The Second Coming. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the centre cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming. Hardly are those words out when a vast image out of spiritus mundi troubles my sight, a waste of desert sand, a shape with lion body and the head of a man, a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun, is moving its slow thighs while all about it wind shadows of indignant desert birds. The darkness drops again, but now I know that 30 centuries of stony sleep will vex to nightmare by a rocking cradle, and what rough beast, its hour come round at last, slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. Um, it's a scary poem, actually. I think, first of all, we have this series of images of things spiralling out of control. So you have this widening, turning Gaia, one of the cones of historical life. You have a falcon that cannot hear the falconer, that has flown loose of its controller. You have the translation of a line from a Greek philosopher, Heraclitus. So this is a bit of ancient wisdom. Everything is in a state of flux or change, Heraclitus famously said. Yeats translates that as, things fall apart. And um, the novelist, of course, Chinoa Akebi would take that line for the title of his famous novel, things fall apart. The centre cannot hold. Anarchy is set loose. Rivers of blood flow. Blood dimmed is another um, noun verb yoked together. Blood dimmed. The blood dim tide. What is doing the dimming to what in that? Both to each. The ceremony of innocence. Perhaps Yeats has in mind um, the traditional ceremony of baptism in Christianity. This immersion in, let's go back, oh, that's coming up. This immersion in uh, purifying water is now a drowning. Perhaps he's remembering also the massacre of the innocents by King Herod in the Bible. The best people, he says, seem to lack all conviction. They seem not to care. The worst people now seem fanatical, single-minded, zealous, fundamentalist. Um, these phenomenon, he says, must be signs, suggesting a revelation is at hand. Perhaps the second coming, the promised return of Christ to earth and the beginning of the kingdom of heaven. But hardly has he spoken those words then a vast image out of the image bank of the world, what he called the spiritus mundi, this collective unconsciousness, um, arises to trouble his sight. He sees a desert waste, perhaps we remember Shelley's sonnet, Ozymandias. He sees a creature not suggesting Christ the Redeemer, but some more ancient and troubling figure, the Sphinx, a shape with lion body and the head of a man, moving its slow thighs through the desert, surrounded by indignant desert birds, a moving sphinx. Darkness falls, and in the final part of the poem, Yeats thinks he now knows what the revelation is. It's a second coming, not of Christ the Redeemer, but of a, a kind of antichrist. This figure has been asleep for 30 centuries, this force, this beast. Its cradle has been rocked until it has been vexed into a nightmare. This is the nightmare of its awakening as it slouches, and slouches as an active verb is, is brilliant. It slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. About the same time that he wrote this poem, remember, 1920, Hitler became leader of the National Socialist Party uh, in Germany. Three years earlier, 
the Bolshevik Revolution had unloosed the blood dim tide in Russia, which would spread across Eastern Europe. Around the same time, <clears throat> 1920, Sigmund Freud is completing his theory of the Oedipus complex about child <coughs> psychosexual development, about how our unconscious mind has a shape that's best exemplified in the story of Oedipus, who lives a nightmare, who kills his father and sleeps with his mother, who lives out that nightmare, and who also stood face to face with the blank and pitiless stare of the Sphinx. And that's uh, a painting by Gustave Moreau that Yeats would have known of Oedipus and the Sphinx. It's an extraordinary poem, isn't it? Well, yes, yes, people asked. But do you really believe in all this weird stuff about beasts and Gaias and the Spiritus Mundi and all that? And Yeats said, they have helped me to hold in a single thought reality and justice. Yes, yes, people said, but do you believe them? They had brought him metaphors for poetry, they said. That's all very well, but do you believe it? People asked him, do you really believe this? Some will ask, if I believe all this book, that this book contains, this is from, the, from a vision, and I will not know how to answer. Does the word belief, used as they will use it, belong to our age? Can I think of the world as there, and I here judging it? I will never think any thoughts but these, or some modification or extension of these. When I write prose or verse, they must be somewhere present, though it may not be in the words. They must affect my judgment of friends and of events. But then there are many symbolisms, and none exactly resembles mine. Uh, I, I think there's, a, there's a, an important thought here in this. Um, when people insist upon the word belief in this way, they seem, don't they, to be talking a language belonging to another time. Does the word belief, as in, do you actually, literally, really believe these things, does this really make sense to us anymore? Can we think of the world as somehow there and ourselves somehow here judging it, deciding what we believe about it. Aren't we, I think Yeats is suggesting, aren't we embedded within the world in a different kind of way? We're unable really to stand outside our beliefs in order to see what they are. We're unable to experience belief in that way at all. I, I think he's suggesting that, and elsewhere he talks about, you discover what you believe when life chooses to tell you. Uh, you cannot really know it for yourselves, at, outside yourself. Now, if that is true, um, and people would disagree, but if, th if that is true, given that difficulty, perhaps the easiest thing to do is to say that you believe in nothing much at all. And Yeats thought that to believe in nothing much at all was, in fact, to be sentimental. This is from his book, Pear... Amica Silentia Lunae, uh, 1917. The title means Through the Friendly Silences of the Moon. And it's a line from uh, Virgil. This, listen to this. Nor has any poet I have read of, or heard of, or met with, been a sentimentalist. The other self, the anti-self, or the antithetical self, as one may choose to name it, comes but to those who are no longer deceived, whose passion is reality. Um, let me just pause that. The anti-self was a kind of reverse side of your own personality which Yeats believed you needed to fuse with, you needed to seek out and unite with. So that's, what he, that's the anti-self. The sentimentalists, he says, are practical men who believe in money, in position, in a marriage bell, and whose understanding of happiness is to be so busy, whether at work or at play, that all is forgotten but the momentary aim. They find their pleasure in a cup that is filled from Lethe's wharf, for forgetfulness, and for the awakening, for the vision, for the revelation of reality, tradition offers us a different word, ecstasy. In other words, Yeats believed, he was convinced that he was dealing with reality. 
in an ultimate sense, and that it was the practical men, the men interested in money and in position, who had deceived themselves in some way about life. If you've ever had the same suspicion uh, that in fact it is those whose understanding of happiness is to be so busy, whether at work or at play, that all is forgotten but the momentary aim, that it's those people who are in fact away with the fairies, those people who seem actually the silliest people of all, if you've dared to build that thought in your imagination, then you should read WB Yeats. So finally, listen to uh, another passage from Per Amica Salentia Lunae. I'm going to finish with this passage. It, in it, Yeats is describing something that a very real experience that would sometimes take hold of him. At certain moments, always unforeseen, I become happy. Most commonly, when at hazard, I have opened some book of verse. Sometimes it's my own verse, when instead of discovering new technical flaws, I read with all the excitement of the first writing. Perhaps I'm sitting in some crowded restaurant, the open book beside me, all closed, my excitement having overbrimmed the page. I look at the strangers near, as if I'd known them all my life. And it seems strange that I cannot speak to them. Everything fills me with affection. I have no longer any fears or any needs. I do not even remember that this happy mood must come to an end. It seems as if the vehicle had suddenly grown, pu suddenly grown pure and far extended and so luminous that the images from Anima Mundi, embodied there and drunk with that sweetness, would, like a country drunkard who has thrown a wisp into his own thatch, burn up time. Maybe an hour before the mood passes, but latterly I seem to understand that I enter upon it the moment I cease to hate. I think the common condition of our life is hatred. I know this is so with me, irritation with public or private events or persons. For the, for the awakening, for the vision, for the revelation of reality, tradition offers us a different word, ecstasy, and you enter into it the moment you cease to hate. Oh, thank you. <laughs>